Hello and welcome to the Daily Friend Show. This is our Friday edition, which you can find on YouTube. Uh, you know, obviously because you're watching this here. Um, but you can find our podcasts on any podcast provider. So I'm joined today uh, with many of my most esteemed, intelligent and wise colleagues. Uh, mm. Ms. Soragon, how are you today? Hi, Nick. Well, and you? Uh, very good, thank you. Mr. Ian Crookshanks, our chief economist. And after that introduction, I suppose we're going to get difficult questions. Oh, uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> you might. And <laughs> Mr. Herman Pretorius. Hi, Nick. Very good to have you all here. Right, thank so you. we're going to kick us right off, I think, by our Ask Sarah here. Um EWC seems to be back with a vengeance. Why don't you tell us exactly what the government is plotting? Plotting is probably the word. Um, what they're hoping to do is they're having a, a series of meetings, committee meetings, that, are, that are tr hope to draft a, a bill, which they hope to have available, and well, not available, but ready by the end of um, November. And then their idea of public participation on an amendment to the constitution is to give us from the, the public from the 10th of December to about the 14th or 15th, or, or the end of January. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not even sure what. The, but the importance is that the, holid the school holidays start on the 5th of December and end on the f around the 15th of January. And being the summer holidays, no one is going to be around if they even know that that is when the... the, the um, period is for making representations and it's way too important to to do that uh, the government pulls that trick every now and again mm. so we've certainly asked called for the period to be extended to a decent period of time at least sort of three months at least but the reason they're pushing it so hard is because they want to be able to be in a position to have the bill come into law become an act at the end of march mm, that's a bit worrying uh herman what can ordinary people do well, uh, they can join organizations like the IRR where we, we genuinely um, exert pressure on the government. Um, our colleague Terence Corrigan can take a lot of credit for having made um, the EWC issue uh, a much more contested one than it might have been. And the IRR really does great research in this field. And... Um, the, the whole purpose of public participation in legislation um, is to make sure that there's some extra accountability, that it's not just democracy is you show up every few years to vote. But public participation must be about getting as many public voices speaking in this debate. And I mean, that, that what can ordinary South Africans do? And, and this might sound incredibly selfish, but join... I, the IRR, sign up as friends of the IRR. Beyond that, if you, if, if you don't want to, but you should, um, then <laughs> pe members of the public can genuinely write to Parliament themselves. Uh, themselves. They can uh, um, call members of Parliament, contact members of Parliament, contact the offices of members of Parliament. These channels aren't, uh, of, of accountability aren't you know, used much in South not Africa. Not nearly as much as they should be. And not nearly as much as they should be. And on this topic, a fundamental constitutional change like this I think we must pull out all stops. I mean, if you have a carrier pigeon, send that thing to Cape Town. If you have, if you do smoke signals, get the, the the point is get this debate going in public. Make the case that it's not just about what the government wants; it's about what the people of this country have a right to want. And I think all of our uh, viewers are familiar with the negative consequences of um, expropriation without compensation about the sort of a constitutional change. But Ian, why don't you take us a little bit through about why it's such a terrible idea? Just as a before I go refresher. on to that, what can the what can the average person do about it? Speak to somebody who works for a newspaper. Say, mm. hey, I want to give you a view. Let's sell a few more newspapers by publishing this 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 opinion. And I think that that's where we could make quite a significant difference by getting it in the public eye. Newspaper headlines. Mm. Um, so uh, why is it a bad idea? There's no doubt, is it a good or a bad idea? It's a terrible idea from a new investment point of view. Here we've got Mr Ramaphosa trying to drum up international support for fixed capital inflow to South Africa. He wants to build new factories, build new businesses, get more, uh, get, get more employment opportunities. And what are we doing? Well, if you'll bring your, your hundreds of billions, hundreds of millions of, of do fixed dollar investment, We'd like to see you put it to work here. 
Oh, by the way, we're going to take X amount in BEE. We're going to do this if, if we like the way the business is going. The regulations may be changed. And it repeatedly one sees that the regulatory environment is changing so constantly that it's very off-putting to the average international uh, capitalist investor. And I think that that is, that, that is it. We, 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 we're chasing away potential new investors. We to just to, to, to make it even more, more difficult for new investment, we regard it as one of the, uh, in, in the lower half of all countries, regarding the difficulty of starting a new, uh, a new business from a regulatory point of view. That's not going to attract what we want, which is fixed capital now, today, job creation and so on. And, uh, and I think that they're going the wrong way around. In addition, there's another point, and that is ESCOM. Until we've got a, a reliable, cost-effective electricity supply, we're not going to get new business. Mm. So don't expect too many of these, this, this capital inflow to go into new factories, into the making of, of more fixed capital goods, which we could export. Can Does I just add to that because it, it, I want to comment on something both uh, on something that both of my colleagues said. I've been doing a I'm writing an article for Herman on EWC and I'm looking at the decision to change the constitution to change section 25. And most of the stuff I'm coming across was occurred when that change when the pr that intention was announced last year. And two things did come up. One is the fact that the seriousness of actually changing a constitutional pr uh, provision, and the other one was, of course, the particularly the foreign investment response to the insecurity of, of their property mm -hmm. rights here. And one of the most cynical things was that um, Zora Ramaphosa kept on saying in regard to changing the constitution that Section 25 does allow for expropriation without compensation. The amendment is just to make it clearer. So, A, we don't need to make it, have it made clearer, and secondly, just saying it will affect the, poten the, the responses from potential right. investors. And, right. and we need to see this issue in context. If on, on, on our, in our latest uh, Reasons for Hope report, uh, measurement of many attitudes and ideological positions and so on of ordinary South Africans, uh, out of 11 priorities that respondents to the poll could identify as what is your top priority for government, land issues came second to last. Mm -hmm. The only thing that uh, uh, after that was, um, you know, affirmative action, uh, BEE needing more attention. At the top of the list, you have things like fighting crime, education, housing, fighting corruption, fighting the, uh, the, 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 the um, you know, the drug uh, epidemic that is uh, affecting specific swathes of, swathes of the country, but especially, you know, the, the gangster areas in, in the Western Cape. So th we must understand that this is very much, you know, just political drum beating about an issue South Africans don't feel very strongly is supposed to be a priority of government. And it's just this mismatch. On the one hand, you have an issue that is, as it were, a lightweight issue, but its consequences are incredibly severe and the consequences will undermine the actual top priorities of South Africans, job creation, um, uh, corruption. I mean, the EWC is just, it's, it's just ripe for corruption. And we see that just um, north of our border. So um, I think in a sort of uh, strange way, we should actually take a little bit of heart from the fact that the government is trying to do this over... Uh, December, because it means that they expect serious resistance. Yes. So and and to, to be fair, that the, um, we often hear that South Africa is a lawless state. There's a lot of you know. There's a lot to say in favour of that. But remember, here we are with a government going through the motions of getting a constitutional change. There's something in that. Mm. There's something in that, that there's a document that they haven't discarded yet completely. Mm. There's a process they haven't discarded yet completely. The fact that they feel they need to cheat the process shows exactly. that the process is nice still work. credible. Yes. No, I, uh, that's very well put. Nicholas, may I make a point? Yes, sir. Add in one there. And that is that government keep on reminding us that the land was taken from the poorer black communities and they're going to get it back. Well, the interesting thing is the service that, that, we ha that we have done say that they mostly don't want it. They want the value. They want the rand's value worth, but no, they don't want to go and sit on a small pl plot no. and eke out a living, which at the moment is particularly difficult mm. with the drought that we're experiencing. A, a quick so I think that that really needs to be emphasised as well. A quick addendum on that. Ian says uh, our surveys, and our surveys do show that, but you know there was a huge survey done 
And that was the actual uh, land reform program of how many people preferred getting back the land or yes. the money. Yes. And it was over 92% of cases. Not This isn't opinion polling. Mm-hmm. This isn't, you know, what do you think you would do? This is factually had the reality. Choice, yes, yeah. They had a choice. They could choose the land or choose the, uh, the compensation. And they went for the compensation. Why the hell not? Compensation, you can send your kids to school with. Land... I yeah. mean, few schools ac- actually accept land as a you know payment for your kids' education. <laughs> as it turns out, being a subsistence farmer is not a very attractive prospect. Yeah. All right, so I, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I do want to move on to it, which is uh, investment. Investment coming into the country and Ramaphosa are trying to pull in large amounts of investment. So recently the government has been crowing about getting, uh, I think it was 300 billion rands worth of new investment into the country. But um, things might not be quite as they seem. Is that right, Ian? I think that's uh, an overly rosy p- picture. Um, what, what we have seen is that a large number of the projects which they say are now coming to fruition have been t- 10 years in the planning stage. And of course it takes a major, a major amount of time to start a new industry, to start a new mine, to start a new agricultural project. This takes a heck of a lot of investment, knowledge, uh, and groundbreaking effort. And what we're seeing is a lot of these announcements are of, uh, of, of efforts which have taken place over this period of working up to a time um, and it's not new ideas, it's not new committed commitments. It's being committed a dec- up to a decade ago and suddenly say, okay, now we're ready to go. That's not new investment as such as they're making out. I think there's a little bit of uh, exaggeration on how much we've actually had. We haven't seen any big inflow into th- into the money market, in- into, uh, into the amount of cash available for credit. All these factors are m- pretty, m- pretty, pretty darn beat right now. Perhaps I can give a little example that gives you an idea of what this investment summit has really been about. Um, Discovery said that it would put in 1.2 billion rand into its new project, which presumably is the new bank. Now, Discovery didn't just say, "Hang on a sec," you know, let's go to the uh, to, to the, the to the health side of our business, take out 1.2 billion that we're not really using, and put it into mm-hmm. the bank. They have planned to put it into the bank, and. Th- it's not a bad thing. I mean, there are a whole lot of companies that have put, agreed to put in billions. But they are investing in what they already have. It, there is nothing new. There is certainly nothing coming in that is going to help keep the lights on. It reminds me of the uh, of the stimulus package that President Ramaphosa implemented in 2018 when I think when we had a technical recession. And if I remember correctly, it, it, they said it was a revenue-neutral stimulus package. <laughs> And that's, I mean, that, that, why bother? That, that's incredible. <laughs> they, they, it, it was, it, it was just moving money from here to here. That's not new investment. And the, as, as Ian says, the, the Im- these investments have been factored in for years. Yes. The, this, this won't spur economic growth. The lackluster economic growth we have already factors these things in. Just to, to go on a little bit of a tangent, I think that's one of my favorite bits of political trickery. When <laughs> And governments all over the world do this, when they spend more money than claim it's revenue neutral. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> it, but it's you know, not just our government that's guilty of that. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a talent to be, you know, that duplicitous. But um, if we're going to speak about the hundreds of billions and you know, these investments, it, what struck me, the one figure that struck me from Tito Mboweni's uh, medium term budget, budget policy, policy statement, statement, goodness gracious, um, we, over the next three years, we will be paying 796 billion rand on debt interest. Gee. That's just debt interest. That's not the debt. If you, with that, you could have hired over a million and I nurses. And my finances were bad. Yeah, no, I mean, if, if, if you come home and you, uh, sorry, ma'am, uh, 796 billion uh, debt interest over the next three years, I mean, you might get a talking to. Um, more than the, the, Our debt interest alone for the next three years could have hired more than a million nurses, 965,000 doctors. It could have built 22,700 kilometers of new roads. It could have paid for 13,900 of Panyaza Lusufi's smart state of the our technological schools. It could have paid the salaries of almost 2 million police officers for three years. That's just the debt 
interest. And now they are going to try and say that uh, uh, 300 billion of already factored in investment will somehow make a difference. Come on. Unlikely. Yes. Yes, it's not a very encouraging prospect. And it really shows that um, a lot of people sort of don't quite wrap their heads around government debt. It's a it's, it's, it's an issue that the public often tends to be bizarrely not very informed on. Um, and I think people don't really realize, and thank you for putting it in concrete terms, exactly mm. what it costs. I think that's part of the sleight of hand is the fact, and I mean, I struggle to, uh, uh, for me to listen to the midterm budget. Um, <laughs> the mini budget. It's like, mm, you know, uh, uh, you know, I've really got to steal myself because I'm not financially it's or economically boring. inclined. It's pretty it's boring. It's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, you know, to him maybe. Um, but it's it's exactly that. I mean, year after year, you basically what people like me want to see is what the results are of mm. the budget. Mm. What what are the minister of finance actually doing? What does he mean? So it's it's an area ripe for uh, a bit of uh, duplicitousness. And, and the say. fact that um, the numbers are so large, people often sort of seem to disassociate right. from yeah. what they actually mean. Mm. Sure. Can I quickly ask Ian a question? Yeah, of course. This is ahead. the second investment summit yeah. yes. in Darbo we've had. Can you what happened? What, what, what were happened the results of the first? first? <laughs> I don't know. It was three hundred odd billion was mooted, and uh, we haven't seen any new fixed investment that has was planned subsequent to that and is now put into fruition. You couldn't, it just couldn't be done in that amount of time. But what it has, what they have, done, what they have done is it like Anglo-Americans, several hundred million mining uh, sector development, that was a 10 year project. And finally, they're starting to activate it. It's not a new, a new plan. It's not a new promise all of a sudden. It's just confirming we were going to do it and in fact, we're now ready to go ahead. In fact, if you want to really be cynical, one would say to our president, don't worry about the conferences. Just sit down in the back room with your guys and start shredding some of the, the legislation that makes it so difficult to start to do business. Well, I've, uh, uh, a boy can dream, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and a girl. <laughs> and a girl. <laughs> All right. Um, well, that was a little bit depressing. So let's, <laughs> let's move on to uh, something a little bit more fun in some senses, but a little bit depressing in other senses. depends on you. Which is... Um, that favourite person of Herman, uh, Mr. Panyaza Lusufi, who you couldn't help but bring and up a little bit earlier. Mm. Um, we've, uh, we've, 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 we've done something to him, haven't we, as the IRR? I can neither confirm. Oh, oh, you oh, we've done something to yes. him. Yes, yes, sorry. I thought you were <laughs> speaking about the contracts um, <laughs> that Taken we funneled out. through, you know, the dark web. After, after the show. After, after the show. show. Cool. Um, no, we have, uh, we have laid a complaint with the public protector uh, regarding very strong indications of maladministration in the Gauteng Department of Education. And we base it on three things. Firstly, these allegations of 1.2 billion rands irregular expenditure by the Gauteng Education Department um, in the year 2018-2019. Uh, the fascinating response to that uh, by Mr. Lusufi was it's not 1.2 billion, it's only 202 million of irregular expenditure. Now, if your excuse is, oh, you know, irregular expenditure is only in the hundreds of millions, not in the thousands of millions, then, I mean, that's that's what's below the bottom of the barrel um, in terms of our expectations for efficient public expenditure. So that's the first thing, is these irregular expenditures we want to be looked at. Secondly, um, about a month ago, they rolled out an e-learning online resource website. Wonderful idea. Uh, Mr. Lusufi uh, boasted that they took six years, and now this project has reached you know, fruition. It's going to change the world. And it's a wonderful idea. It really is um, to make uh, educational resources as accessible as possible. However, if you look at the website, it's free open source software, most of it, <laughs> that they spent six years using outdated open source free software to build a flagship website. And I just want to know who was paid, how much, and what did they do? That's a very good question. I mean, this is an interesting... If we could turn this somehow into a way to generate electricity <laughs> with this level of transference that you use something... <laughs> very, you put in a lot of money and you get something very bad out the other end, right? It's a magical... Yeah, it's like here. Belgium. But <laughs> um, the... Uh, and and then the last issue is, of course, this placement system th that uh, about 30,000 grade 1s and grade 8s are not yet placed in Gauteng schools for the year 2020. Now, this isn't a new system. This system was rolled out 
for the first time in 2016, and it never functioned optimally. And you have to ask the question, if you can expend more energy on spotting fake mm. apartheid flags in Japan <laughs> than actually doing your day job, making sure that you don't accidentally waste hundreds of millions of rands, you don't pay people and give them six years to develop something a grade 10 learner could have done, you know, as part of a fun hobby for IT, and you don't jeopardize their education of thousands of young South Africans. You know, perhaps your priorities are wrong. If, 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 if you know, you can see the word on your blind blow, but you can't see 202 million rand being badly spent. I think that is a very good point, is that Panyazala Sufi seems to be doing his best to damage, damage race relations and to gym up racial conflict, um, while at the same time misspending government money. Well, I, I, I'd like to claim two things. One is, I, I know have a little bit of history on uh, Panyaza Lusufi and the other is he was my bet noir before he was his bet noir. <laughs> um, <laughs> basically, I, I can't even now remember how many years ago, five or six years ago, the, de the um, National Department of Education um, set in motion an investigation into what was wrong in the um, uh, education system, but not from an educational point of view, but from a point of corruption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, well, again, nothing was actually done. I've read the, we've all read the report. It's, it was out. But interestingly, um, s w the, the report found that six out of nine provinces had been captured by Satu, one of them w of which is Gauteng. Now, this, pre these, this predated uh, Le Sufi. But you, you do kind of have to wonder if there isn't... If it isn't still captured by Satu, particularly the idea of of, of the sort of internet learning uh, side of things. I mean, the Sufi loves to to be involved in the alleged racist incidents at school, and I'm not sure I've yet found one on investigation that is in fact ra racist. But what has happened is there must be something. In, I'm not even sure what the number of schools are that have been closed in Soweto, because. Parents are, 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 you know, are voting with their feet. They're taking their children to private schools in Soweto mm. or to, to government schools in the suburbs. Mm. And it, the Sufi has a habit of blaming this on the legacy of apartheid and Afrikaans-speaking schools or whatever the case may be. But the reality is that you know, you, a decent school, the buildings are there, the, the infrastructure is there. It may have rotted a bit by now, but surely the goal is to try and reopen those schools and put in place decent teachers, et cetera, et cetera, and, for, and not force kids to travel to, to better schooling. And that, I think, has been the particular weakness. One of the problems that Lesufi has is that Gauteng is, the, is the, m the province with the most amount of migration into the province every year. Mm -hmm. So the strain on the, on the, on the uh, facilities is huge, and that's part of the problem with the 30,000. But there's no doubt the, the application process that used to be done at the schools he took away, he's increasingly wanting to take power away from mm. the governing bodies at the schools. And frankly, it's all coming back to bite him. But uh, don't forget, this is not a purely South African problem. Remember the busing uh, outbreaks of, of violence that there was in America in the middle 60s. You no, know, absolutely. When actually a whole lot of pupils, staff and all got shot yeah. by the police. So... Uh, it, it's just interesting that we don't learn from other people's mistakes but either. Ex except that the, the odd, there are different bases to this, and here, mm. it, here it's a case of that the department is, is, is leading to the complications, mm. because having sat on governing bodies for, for many, many years, you realise you, you realize what the problems are. I mean, some governing bodies do not cannot operate well, and, and, but that's, there's, there's other ways of dealing with that. But it's the very fact that you're taking autonomy away from parents, and there's mm. no doubt you let the parents decide on the uh, on the budget of a school annually at the annual general meeting and you'll you'll see much better results mm. so it's 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 a complete matzo pudding <laughs> <laughs> very well put all right well i think that's uh, about concludes for today's discussion thank you everyone thank if you, you uh, like the work that the institute of race relations does you can sms your name to 32823 it's on the board over there um SMSs cost one round, terms and conditions apply. Please do check us out on our sort of social media platforms. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, um, where you can see a lot of our content. Um, and also look out for the Daily Friend podcast, which you can find on all podcast apps. Um, and that comes out on Monday and Wednesday. Thank you very much for watching and have a good weekend.